Welcome to our service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Chetwin. Let's pray. O oh Lord, help us to focus on you and your timing and not our own agenda. We know you are aware of the difficulties of the past year and we know that you can make a way where there is no way. It's been a long haul, but your church still stands to serve you and your people. Help us to remain steadfast and keep focused on your big picture. Amen. Colossians chapter 2. Paul mentions the churches at Colossae and Laodicea very early in this chapter. Verses 1 to 5. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Now Laodicea was just a few miles north of Colossae. It was a wealthy trade center, but it certainly had its problems. And sometimes those problems were difficult to address. If we take a look at what Christ says about Laodicea in Revelation, we will find part of the problem. There were other problems as well, and Paul goes on to address these in other chapters, so we will cover them as they come up. But in these opening words, he's counting on the ties of love to bring these churches together and to encourage each other to remain true to God's plan of salvation in Christ. He's reminding them to keep their focus on the big picture and not get sidetracked. See his warning in verses 3 to 4? In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so won't, no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. So let's quickly move to Revelation to see what John writes to this church as a warning. Apparently they didn't heed Paul's advice. Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 to 22. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything that I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. The ch church in Laodicea had it all, or so they thought. Laodicea was the wealthiest of seven cities. When we read this portion of Revelation, we see that God knows the city really well. He likens their faith to lukewarm water. You see, Laodicea had always had a problem with their water supply. They had built an aqueduct to bring water to the city from hot springs. But by the time the water reached the city, it was only lukewarm. It was neither hot nor cold. The church had become as bland as its water supply not refreshing and not hot. Now I like hot water and I like cold water on a hot day, but lukewarm water is disgusting. The believers in that church didn't take a stand for anything. They had become idle. God used the message 
in Revelation to relay a message that they would easily understand. He used lukewarm water to indicate his dislike for lukewarm faith. The faith of the Laodiceans was self-satisfied and self-made. There are those even today that make the assumption that if you have money and possessions, that it is a sign of God's blessing on their lives. Now it can be, God does give us what we need, but there is a certain danger in that kind of thinking. Priorities become different when you have to chase the almighty dollar. We all know, have known seasons of plenty and seasons of hardship, so it's easy for us to understand how once one starts being successful by the world's standards, we want to maintain it. It's comfortable. But God often calls us to be uncomfortable, partially because then we have to re rely on a power outside of ourselves, and that power is God. For the Laodiceans, they had been lulled to sleep by their self-satisfaction. They were no longer growing in faith or evangelism. They had forgotten the initial, initial command to go out, preach, and teach, and to be God's witnesses to the world through service. They took their eyes and their hearts off the big picture. So in Revelation, God was asking this church to wake up and smell the coffee. Now back to Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 6 to 10. And now, just as you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. We all know that receiving Christ as our Lord of our lives is just the beginning to a life with Christ. We've focused on that over and over again, but it is still just the beginning. We all know the importance of following his leadership by being rooted, built up, and strengthened in the faith. Christ wants to be actively involved in all aspects of our lives, not just the good parts, but the not so good parts as well. He knows when we have those moments and we have to remember that those moments, while they may seem to go on forever, in the light of eternity, they are still just moments. And we have not been left on our own with this. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit that teaches, strengthens, and gives wisdom, and certainly reminds us of God's grace, power, and love. Paul uses the illustration of our being rooted in Christ to being planted and growing. Just like plants draw nourishment from the soil through their roots, so we draw all our life-giving strength from Christ. There are far too many days in our lives when I am aware of just how much I need that strength because I can't do it on my own. There have been far too many nights that I've wanted to curl up in a fetal position and stay there. But then another day dawns and somehow those days pass. The more we draw strength from Christ, the less we will be fooled by others who claim to have the answers to all of life's questions. I can relate to Paul's terminology about plants being rooted, deeply rooted and being fed. You see, I have a plant that wilts and looks almost dead after I have forgotten it a while. My fault, not the plants. Yet when I see it practically lying over on its side, I rush to give it water. It's in a large pot, and it's well-rooted, probably needs a bigger pot. But when I water it, I can sit and literally watch its leaves perk up and stand up straight again. We too need to be rooted and well-fed spiritually. We need to have our roots go deep into the soil so the winds of life can't destroy us, and Christ is the only way. Paul writes against any philosophy that's based on human ideas and experiences. He condemns teaching that credits humanity and not Christ with being the answer to life's problems. When we look around at all the self-help books on bookstore shelves, we see all kinds of teaching on man-made approaches to all of life's problems. They totally disregard God. Once again, we must maintain that focus on the big picture. Don't let life's curveballs distract you. Use your mind. Keep your eyes on Christ and study God's word. Verses 11 to 19. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. 
Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to a new life because you trusted him, you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only a shadow of reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Paul issues a couple of strong reminders to these people in Laodicea. He reminded them of the desires of their past life before they met Christ, and they will threaten to surf resurface if they aren't keeping their eyes and hearts on the big picture. Because of the new nature that we've been gifted with when Christ was crucified, that old rebellious nature has been crucified as well and has been replaced with a new and loving nature. God has declared us not guilty, and we no longer have to live under sin's power. But temptation being what temptation is, there will be times when we still feel like sinning. The difference is we used to be slaves to that sinful nature, but now we are free to live for Christ. Our debt for sin has been paid in full by the precious blood of Christ. The constant reminders and temptations that the world serves up to us on a regular basis will just confuse that big picture that God has in store for his children. We must always remember whose children we are and walk in it daily. As we do, we will grow accordingly. Paul also reminded them and us that it is he who holds all together. He is our creator, but even more than that, he is our sustainer. Notice verse 19. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Our restored relationship with God has given us a special gift. We are now connected with Christ, who is the head of the body. I don't think that Paul is just talking about our physical bodies, but is also referring to the body of believers. The fundamental problem with the false teachers of Paul's day was they were not connected to Christ, the head of the body of believers. If they had been joined to him, they could not have taught, taught false doctrine or lived immorally. The past couple of years here have been a difficult ones. Have you fa how have you fared? Can you still say, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name? If you're like most of us, some days were better than others. But each day when you meet with Jesus at the foot of the cross, you will be reminded that he is a good God. And the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, can echo through your mind and remind you of whose child you are. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Amen.